Hey, welcome to Deep Focus. I'm Mitch Goldman, and this is part two of our three-part podcast from July 22nd, 2019. Vijay Iyer was here in the studio with me, and our topic was the magnificent Jerry Allen, who was, like Vijay, both uh, very inventive, magnificent pianists, and Jerry Allen was somebody I always wanted to have on this show. Um, her death was, um, that was one of the very, very relatively minor uh, frustrations, sadnesses, and disappointments that um, that brought about. Uh, but it was one, and I got to say, um, having Vijay here with me, remembering Jerry Allen and, and sharing his, getting to hear with his ears a little bit of her music is very uh just so insightful and healing because her loss to the music scene is never going to be uh erased but um uh, hope you enjoy this music if you do please subscribe you can find us at mitchgoldman.podbean.com you can find deep focus on the podbean app or apple podcasts or spotify itunes what have you chrome safari all free no advertising it's it's all yours here enjoy part two from 2019 vijay i are my guest on the subject of jerry allen on deep focus <laughs>
Another beautiful ballad from Charlie Hayden Sandino. And that 
live recording from Jerry Allen, Charlie Hayden, Paul Motion, Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, 1991, at the special suggestion of my guest Vijay Iyer here in the studio. We call the show Deep Focus. Thoughts? <laughs> Response? Uh, well, first of all, it was, uh, they played a Paul Motion tune before they played Oblivion. I think that tune was Mumbo Jumbo. And um, so we're hearing like this, you know, even within this group, there was this span of sensibilities and um, they could evoke a lot of different eras of the music. Cause they could yeah. Be this, you know, like that, um, the approach to Paul Motion's tune was kind of like, um, kind of an open improvisation uh, dealing with uh, sort of thematic material from the composition and getting into these textures and densities and um, basically that there's it's not pulsed but it's kind of uh, has a lot of motion in it anyway and no pun <laughs> intended I apologize yeah, for that well. but like <laughs> that's the quality that it has this sort of it's uh, it moves without um, having a distinct pulse and so you always feel like it's going somewhere, um, although that those the way it does that is kind of immeasurable, and that's something special about it. So then you hear these like phrases kind of uh, juxtaposed in counterpoint with one another, and you hear um, you hear these in interesting individual choices about how to feed the energy, how to build tension, how to create contrast, how to keep things moving. And uh, that, um, you know, it's, again, like what was special about this group is that there was such maturity and wisdom in the way those choices were made um, and communicative power, you know. Uh, so then after that, they did Oblivion. So um, that's this classic but powell burner <laughs> it's yeah, uh, quite uh, a maze actually to play it's hard it's a hard tune to play that that was a sounded like a finger buster yeah and they took it pretty up there yeah. like quarter note equals what 380 i don't know yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> charlie hayden and paul motion yeah. they're they're not like you know schoolyard athletes i don't think <laughs> at this point in their lives i don't think who do you think called that one i'm curious I don't any know. Idea? I mean, I I could imagine any of them yeah. being into it, you know. Um, and they are. You could hear the enthusiasm oh, that they yeah. all bring to it. And Charlie's really holding it down, like he's not. Yeah, um, yeah, he's playing. Like he's, you know, he's not skating in any way. He's like really holding it down. Um, yeah. And and Jerry's playing like really hard. Like she's playing oh, these in, these insistent rhythms. Uh, a lot of joy in it, a lot of exuberance. Um, and she had this, I mean, part of what intrigued me when I first heard her about it was a, how she would navigate changes in a way that didn't feel like, um, it wasn't like outlining, you know, like, um, you know, the way people are taught to play changes is like you indicate them by like, arpeggiating the chord or playing the scales that go with those chords or something like that. And she never had the need to do that. Um, you know, there's certain musicians I listened to who had that way of sort of trans, you know, um, basically being able to play melodically no matter what was happening. Um, and in a way that was still navigating the harmonies, but not kind of like beholden to them to this, to the point where, they're trying to demonstrate something, you know. Um, that's that's kind of the point, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I would hope that uh, harmony should serve you. You know, you don't have to serve it. Yeah. Um, and it should empower you, is what I'm saying. It shouldn't um, be something that you're owned by. You know, uh, I'd say that the first musician who kind of sh like highlighted that possibility for me was. What, in my own experience of listening, was Joe Henderson. Because mm. he could really, um, 
he could say whatever he wanted to say at any moment in any song. Like, that's basically how it was. Sonny Rollins, too. But I'd say, like, you know, in a way, I'd say Joe Henderson really um, uh, epitomized it for me. And then, when you know, as I got deeper into Coltrane and Herbie Hancock and different musicians from, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s and listening to the previous decades so you know few decades worth of stuff like how did other people handle this problem you know <laughs> and uh um but i just remember that hearing jerry's take on that like how do you deal with a harmonic maze like this tune which has like two chords every bar like relentlessly you know um and they keep uh you know so you know the songs in E flat, so therefore the first chord is A minor. Of course. Like, you know, so there's, so how do you, you know, so you're always going from somewhere to somewhere. You're always harmonically, like, uh, unstable. Like, you're always in motion, like, or lean, leading somewhere. So how do you do that without um, just spelling it out all the time? And she had a way of, uh, I think this had to do with her studies of Dolphy, um, among other things. But uh, she had a way of being able to, it's almost like she could, just cut right through all the inessential stuff and um, create her own tension and release. You know, that uh, was, it's not that she's ignoring the changes at all, but it's that she has a diff, has like this kind of transcendent knowledge of them so that she can create uh, freely, basically freely creating in relation to harmony. Hearing you describe that makes me want to hear that song again now because yeah. I, I mean and she's pl she's playing so much yeah she's playing so fast and like and and melodically and in it and responding to the other musicians on stage and yeah well i think some you'll hear a bit more of that with the next tune that's on the set list at least if this is correct which all right we so we'll keep to. moving forward we won't go <laughs> <laughs> well i mean part of what we'll hear is her dealing with this Herbie Nichols tune called Shuffle Montgomery, which also has a bounce to it and had his own, like, you know, weird kind of uh, insistent harmonic maze that's kind of, you know, you have to deal with. Um, and she was just, I mean, I think the thing is that she always seemed unbothered by harmony while still really clearly dealing with it, like having this very rooted sensibility about it. Um, so it's that kind of mastery, I guess, is something that uh, that really grabbed me and that I've studied a lot in her playing. Herbie Nichols is another of these. He's kind of a composer's composer, isn't he? Yeah, and sort of unsung. Um, he wrote a lot of really uh, mysterious tunes, like <laughs> songs that had these... Um, you know, if you look at basically like the building blocks that people were thought to be de dealing with were what you find in the sort of uh, so-called American songbook, like the Tin Pan Alley tradition, which is functional harmony with these sort of secondary dominants and a lot of modulations and stuff like that. And then you'd look at like, what are these harmonic entities in Herbie Nichols' music? And they're... It's deceptively simple often. It's sort of like the way chords lead into one another is not, it's not like, uh, it's not a cadence like you'd find in, I don't know, like in some, in like Beethoven or something. It's something else. So he had this, uh, these, um, basically he was fearless about post-tonal materials. And, uh, but then also had this foot in the old school. So like, there was also this kind of like weird, almost surreal, sly, swinging, kind of nonchalant quality to that he had uh, a lot of humor in the music. Um, and then there would be this strange kind of darkness in it, like these, like an augmented triad in the bottom octave of the piano, you know, <laughs> like this weird kind of murky object that is just put there in the middle of the song it's like what is that you know and then hearing uh hearing him and then also the way he constructed his lines would be these strange um 
dances around, you know, conventional chords like the, he build these, he build melodies off of these so-called upper structures or these sort of, um, you know, sort of, uh, like the one tune that I remember of Herbie's that, Herbie Nichols that I studied is, that I recorded called Wildflower, um, where it's sort of this, uh, you know, harmonically it's, it feels conventional, but then when you study the melody, you realize that he has expanded <laughs> on what's happening. It's just kind of one six two five thing in B flat, like that. That's what you hear. So it's this like it feels like it's kind of running around in circles in a conventional way. But then the melody, um, it seems like it's in two other keys at the same time. So it's that kind of stuff that would be like sort of surreal juxtapositions across this nonchalant backdrop, you know. And that even includes um, Lady Sings the Blues, which is probably his most famous composition. Uh, yeah. So anyway, Shuffle Montgomery is one of those sort of um, intermediate pieces of his that has like um, has a kind of groove and a bounce and almost like a – it's a shuffle, you know. <laughs> it's like – but then it has some – slightly surreal elements in it and then hearing i remember this was maybe on their first trio album this might have been on etudes this song so i'm excited to hear it live vijay Iyer is my guest and the subject of deep focus tonight is jerry allen and we're listening to her in a trio setting with charlie hayden and paul motion a kind of a super group a uh, <laughs> collaborative trio it that became one for sure yeah well but even straight out the gate like from the first sounds on that first record you knew that this was something new yes and uh seemingly an unlikely trio to some at the beginning but uh clearly shared vision and uh they're they're in it mm-hmm. on this date no question about that november 1991 from the WKCR archives in Queen Elizabeth Hall in London. And uh, we're going to hear the end of the set. Shuffle Montgomery, and uh, maybe we can get them to come out and do an encore. I hope they do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out. I mean, A little bird told me. <laughs> well, yeah. who can say? Right. Who can predict the future? <laughs> uh, it's uh, Mitch Goldman, and the show's Deep Focus. I'm with Vijay Iyer on WKCR.
what a set. What a set. Jerry Allen, Charlie Hayden, Paul Motion. Paul Motion had the last word there. <laughs> he knows his way around a shuffle, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. What do you think? You think we can get them to come back out? Let's try. I Clap your it, hands. Man. Clap your hands, everybody. Let them hear you. They can't hear you. <laughs> they can't hear you. Let them hear it, folks. <laughs> I, bet they, I bet they do Lonely Woman. What do you think? Uh, my, my chips are on something else. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Well, um... If you had to guess, you think they're going to come back out? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do know that. Did you talk to them? um, I do know that Jerry was not only a fan of Herbie Nichols and Bud Powell, but of Thelonious Monk. Uh So my money is on Monk. Uh Uh-huh.
They're feeling it. No doubt about it. Yes. That was the encore from Jerry Allen, Charlie Hayden, and Paul Motion in London, Queen Elizabeth Hall, November 1991. And if you're just joining us, you missed quite a set. You also missed the insight that I've been taking great nourishment from <laughs> of Vijay Iyer, my guest on Deep Focus, who chose Jerry Allen for the topic tonight. Oh, man. And, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, you know, thank you for um, insisting on... Thank you for insisting that we listen to an entire concert because uh, you really hear the arc of something and you hear um, an aggregate of choices over an entire hour or hour plus in this case. You hear um, how different pieces relate to each other and, like, how they balance each other out and uh, you hear larger shapes, you know, larger than in any given piece. We're so used to thinking nowadays in terms of tracks and stuff, and, and to hear a concert is a different animal. That's really like, it's a it's its own event, you know. I think that should be the unit that we assess music on from now on. It's, uh, I gotta tell you, too, you know, <laughs> this show, I don't know how many of the listeners are actually with us for the whole three hours. <laughs> it's like, you know, I was thinking about it recently. Like, who does that? What do you, you know? What, who does anything for three hours now? Hmm. And they, you know, uh, carving out time for that. It's not easy. So if you've been with us from the beginning, I salute you, dear <laughs> listeners. And yes, that is, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Vijay, because um, that's a, yeah, that's a big part, deep focus. That's a big part of what it's about, and yeah. uh, diving deep and seeing what you pull out. You don't know until you go all the way in there. Right, and, you know, there are a lot of options here, and you came up with quite a trove of, <laughs> of uh, un, you know, previously unheard or unreleased concert recordings. Um, this was, I guess, this one was broadcast on the radio in, in the UK. Um, and I was hoping we could cover, like, all of these things <laughs> and then you know it's actually it's a nice experience to sit with one and and feel what they felt you know like over the course of the of the evening yeah yeah i think so that's a, that to me that's a big part of it yeah and um yeah i'm, I'm uh, well having had the experience of hearing a set you put together last night <laughs> i got to say oh that was I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, maybe, maybe not, maybe a little bit. That was a, a masterful work. That group, you, that group has a sound. And you guys filled that stage and filled that room. And you could, everybody in the room knew it at the Village Vanguard that this was, there was, it was a, steam locomotive or whatever might have started i wasn't there tuesday wednesday thursday etc but man it came to a head sunday night yeah sure did yeah it's always I mean, that was our that was my third time leading a group there and it's all you know something takes over in that room when you speak in, when you um when you play for uh when you play 12 times in one room in a week <laughs> and uh also that room in particular you know, it's just a, it's a basement. Like, it's not this um, looks kind of place. But so much has happened in that space. And I'm not sure how else to put it except, like, something takes over when you're in there. That uh, when you're playing, that it doesn't feel like it's you playing. You know, it feels like something is uh, speaking through you. And I think that's maybe what music has always been. You know, especially in, you know, maybe humankind like first gathered in caves, you know, in these right. cloistered kind of spaces. They're all piled up on top of each other. It's very intimate and it's also kind of mysterious, you know, like you feel like anything could happen and um, you don't know. In a way, like um, individual agency is kind of uh it becomes more distributed it's sort of like everybody's responsible for what's happening so there's no um you know it's nominally my band but there's this real 
collective intelligence that emerges and you feed off of the audience, the energy, the attention, and the, the focus that you get from them. And the and uh, you can hear them breathing, you know. It's like, uh, it's very reciprocal. That was a good crowd. That was very yeah. attentive and responsive. It, that's the way it felt sitting yeah, in the room. Yeah, it sure did, yeah. It's always, yeah, it's nice to, you know, we've played uh, outdoor festivals a lot and we've played indoor spaces a lot but playing in a place like that where everyone's kind of piled up on top of each other is is uh it's a it's spe- there's something special about it where um you can um you can really dig it well so. don't don't i think you guys had a little something to do with it yeah we had something <laughs> to do with it for sure um well it's also that this band has been working that's in my sextet you know we've been working uh, pretty steadily for the last couple of years, and um, and with this drummer Jeremy Dutton since last year. In fact, he started with us our last run at the Vanguard, which is May of last year, and we've done I don't know a hundred or more, probably more than well over a hundred shows together. So wow! Like so sounds like it. Yeah, and he he's he's a big part of it. I mean, filling the throne of Tyshawn Sorry is yes. no small task. No small task at all. And uh, he's, he ain't holding back, man. Well, he's, he's got really, a lot to know, say. Yeah, it's been really exciting to hear him grow and uh, hear him rise to the challenges. That's great. Yeah, well, it was a, an abundant joy. Thank you for the music. Thank you. And, so uh, much. well, a uh, little uh, tug on the coat of the listeners. <laughs> Don't miss your next opportunity to hear any set at the Village Vanguard. It's always a delight. That is that is the real <laughs> center of the universe. <laughs> I've I've been around long enough to say. Mm. I think I've been around long enough to say that that is just about the only club that's been around longer than I've been listening to mm. this music in mm. New York mm. and um, it's still my favorite place to hear music and it's uh, and especially the next opportunity you have to hear Vijay Iyer mm. which if you're in New York you've got something up coming up uh, here in Morningside Heights I understand. yeah just a block or so away from where we're sitting right now um, I'm going to be the subject of a composer's portrait at Miller Theater on October 24th. Um, we're going to have the New York premiere of a violin concerto that I wrote two years ago called Trouble, because we're all in trouble right now. Um, there's also a piece that premiered earlier this year by L.A. Philharmonic uh, that I wrote for them called Crisis Modes, um, a new piece for a solo viola called Song for Flint, um, so it's sort of the more chamber music and orchestral music side of what I do, uh, which I've gotten deeper into in recent years. Uh, but it's all drawing from the same the same concepts, the same well of energies, the same sensibilities about listening and um, rhythm and everything else. It's, uh, it's still me, just in a different uh, different package, that's all. How do people keep up with what you're doing? Do you uh, do the social media and all that? Yeah, uh... <laughs> Somewhat, although I've really, I don't know what works anymore, and I don't really try as hard as I used to. I just hope that people get word. If they want to know. Yeah, I do have a Twitter account, at, at Vijay Iyer, also on Instagram, at Vijay Iyer. That's V-I-J-A-Y-I-Y-E-R, and I have a website, if people still look at those, I don't know. Oh, you know. That's uh, vijay-ayer.com. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, that was a really stupendous set of music that we just heard from that magnificent trio that uh, you and I obviously both have a lot of love for. And uh, we didn't really talk too much about that around midnight. I, should we? Uh, I w- it, was, it was another just thunderbolt from the blue. Yeah. But um, I loved... I'll, oh, go ahead. I'll toss something out there that uh, the way Jerry Allen kind of moved in and out of that very monkish idiom without kind of uh, aping it, but making it hers, but honoring him and honoring the song. Yeah, I mean, there's a uh, really nice solo version 
that she recorded on her album Homegrown in the mid '80s, um, which you know when I first heard that, like that's a there's that and there's also a version of Bemsha Swing I think yeah. on that same record, and um, you really hear that she's studied it like that's what that means you know that I mean when you hear people copying Monk it means they haven't really studied it it means they're just um, sort of stealing skimming off the surface basically but when you hear someone really dealing with the same elements he's dealing with you know and and dealing with them in their own way you know I always remember this phrase that Muhal Richard Abrams said to me about Monk it was one of the first times that I met Muhal in the late 90s, maybe 97. And we got to talking about Monk. And he said, yeah, Monk was always creating. Always creating. That's what he said. <laughs> and uh, that's. I think about that every day. You know, it's been more than 20 years since he told me that. And it's true. It's so true. I can't even tell you how true it is. Like, I was just talk, speaking with um, Rodney Kendrick last month because we were both on the Randy Weston tribute concert at the Kennedy Center and um, he put it he basically said the same thing he said you know the thing about Monk he did whatever the bleep he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it like at, at, at all times then he said do you know how hard that is <laughs> <laughs> it's true <laughs> It sounds easy, but it's actually the opposite of easy because it means like you're actually um, you're always experiencing something for for the first time, and that's true even when he would play the tunes that he played thousands of times in his life. That when he would play them, somehow it wasn't just a repetition, and even a phrase being repeated was not a repetition. It was actually like experiencing an idea anew and fresh. And so that meant like you had to be in a certain state of mind to do that. It's um, there's something really uh, grounded and elemental about it, you know. And she, you can hear her doing that with his mater- with those materials that are in that song. It's like, okay, this is the song, but how do I make it the song now? You know, not the song of fifty years ago. You can hear her doing it. Mm-hmm. Well put. Well, we're going to turn the page, and we've got another prize from the archives. Yes. Um, I should say, you're listening to WKCR-FM New York, WKCR-HD1. Maybe you're at 89.9 FM or WKCR.org. And uh, however you come at it, Jazz Alternatives is the program heard each weeknight from 6 to 9 p.m. I'm Mitch Goldman. And um, from time to time, we do these deep focus programs. We have a guest, Vijay Ayers, here with us tonight. And Vijay has turned the lens on the magnificent Jerry Allen. Yes. And uh, this is a whole other thing we got going. <laughs> just two years later than what we just heard. Yes. Uh, and just yeah. across the uh, channel. Right. <laughs> In Paris. Gay Paris. <laughs> um, this is Jerry Allen featured with the one and only, one of the greatest singers of all time. Betty Carter, and this was a stellar band with Jerry Allen, Jack DeJanette, and Dave Holland. Oh my God! Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, they made an album called "Feed the Fire," and that's the that's a tune of Jerry's that kicks off this set. You ready? You got yep. your seatbelt fast. Yeah, sure. got your helmet on. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, this is a live recording from the KCR archives. Music from Betty Carter and a feature on Jerry Allen on piano. Love, love, love. 
talk about Miss Jerry Allen. That's her tune called Feed the Fire. Dave Holland on bass. Take a bow, sweetie. Mr. Jack Dijonet on bass. She got. Thank you very much. Part two of this three-part podcast from 2019, July 22nd. Vijay Iyer, my guest on Deep Focus, and the topic was Jerry Allen and Mitch Goldman. Hey, if you enjoy this program, you should definitely subscribe. New episodes come out uh, starting every Tuesday, and there are dozens of episodes up there now. I've got hundreds <laughs> they are going to be coming at you. And um, if there's one artist that's not your favorite, I'm sure we're going to find another one that might be. So please come along for the ride. Tell some friends. Rate us. Do all that good stuff. Make it part of your life uh, if you enjoy this program. And you'll find us at all the usual places. Home base is mitchgoldman.podbean.com. And um, I've been amazed that we have listeners all over the United States, all over Canada, all over Europe, and far-flung places beyond in Brazil, in India, in New Zealand, in Panama, in Indonesia, in Malta, in Chile, in Turkey. Uh, it's really just such a thrill. You guys are coming along on this ride for us, and i got so much more terrific things coming your way, including part three of this program, the final part. So uh, jump over and check that out, and we'll see you soon. I'm Mitch Goldman. It's Deep Focus.